Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that some people really mean it when they say they know what you're feeling. Those people have a disorder called mirror touch synesthesia, which is a disorder of the mirror neurons that fire whenever they see someone else experience something. They actually feel whatever they watch another person experience. That would, I think the technical word for it is that would totally suck. It, it's healthy that we have mirror neurons because they allow us to empathize and, and it's a core part of how we learn and how we connect with other people. But if it's misfiring, uh, that would be worse than normal synesthesia, which would be kind of cool to be able to like smell the color red. That I would be up for trying. Today's guest on Bulletproof Radio is Nick Ordner, who's CEO of The Tapping Solution. He's a author of the New York Times bestselling book called The Tapping Solution. And he's created a documentary film by the same name. And you've heard me talk with Nick before because tapping is a really interesting way to kind of talk to your nervous system at a level that you probably don't normally talk to your nervous system. He's been on Dr. Oz and Psychology Today, Women's Health, Huffington Post, and he's basically a kind of a famous guy. The tapping solution is, is a big deal, I think is the technical term for it. Nick, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Dave. It's, you know, like you said, I've been on Dr. Oz, but... I never watched the show, so it wasn't that big of a deal to be on there. <laughs> and I listen to your podcast all the time. Oh. It's 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 a regular on my uh, podcast feed. So, you know, I was ready for the cool fact of the day. And I just remembered I didn't plan for the three things at the end. So now I'm like, oh, man, you know, I had years to plan for my three amazing things. I'm just going to have to be off the cuff with it. So That's good because off the cuff is better. When people yeah. strategically plan the three <laughs> most important things, it's always like, it's like they're reading from a laundry list. We don't want that. Yeah. And you also, you, you sort of, with your cool fact of the day, answered a question for me. I had a buddy in, in college who, when we were watching Friends, it was like the hot show on TV then, he could not watch it. Whenever there was an uncomfortable situation going on, he would just freak out, leave the room, absolute panic. Really? And I think that he had, you know, we all have this, and it, it certainly plays into what we're going to talk about today with our emotional system and stress. We all have this empathy, right, where we connect with people. But he just felt it so deeply that he was just like, I can't watch this embarrassing situation. I'm out of the room. Wow. That's that's interesting. So you've actually met someone like that. Well, I, I don't know if he had the disorder, but, he, you know, he was he was it was serious for him. You know? Wow. People are so unusual, just the amount of wiring and, and to the things that drive people nuts. Uh, I'm working on the Bulletproof biohacking labs up here in my house, and we have a float tank that just got installed. Yeah. So one of the people who was helping to clean it was was in this thing. It was like a kind of a giant clamshell, like either spacecraft or coffin. And uh, so she was, was getting the sawdust out that was left over from construction because we we're filling it. And one of the, the other guys was like, here, let me close that for you. And, and she just about jumped out of her skin, right? Because we have those little triggers and there it was a claustrophobia thing. So yeah. it, if you have that, it, it's, it's amazing. Now, if you met someone like that who had claustrophobia, knowing that you're basically hacking our nervous system with tapping, would you, is there something you could do for someone who had claustrophobia? No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And it could either, you know, I could work with them and perhaps get what, we call one minute miracles where we literally tap and for five or 10 minutes and she never has claustrophobia again, or it might take more time. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it happen. It's, it's, it's shocking the speed in some circumstances, but I don't want to say that that's common or what happens all the time though. It does happen. If it wasn't that within an hour session, within a couple of sessions where we dig back and say, okay, cause look, what's claustrophobia likely some experience at some point in her life, that trigger that event. And it could be as simple as being four years old, being in a closet when you're playing hide and go seek and having panic set in. And then all of a sudden the body, nervous system, everything says, this is an unsafe situation. Boom, claustrophobia sets in. Or it could be a really traumatic experience, you know, where someone really had something terrible happen to them. Sometimes it's the simple things in life that set us up for failures in the future and to have these difficult experiences. And sometimes it's the complicated things that build up to create PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and so forth. So yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, one of the things that my friends and family say about me and tapping is that, you know, don't say anything is wrong around Nick because he'll make you tap on it. So <laughs> if I was there and she was panicking, I'd say, let's explore this right now because that's one of the things about this tool. It's so easy to explore. You know, it's not like you've got to go 
away for a week. It's not that you have to, you know, study it for a year. You can have an experience within five minutes and then decide for yourself, is it working or not? So uh, I, I don't actually failed to mention that we have a live studio audience today. Uh, it's a live studio audience of one, uh, but uh, Gordy Murgo from Business Week is here because they're they're doing a profile, and I'm just realizing that he probably doesn't know what tapping is, which means well, everyone driving in their car right now probably exactly. also doesn't know. So and they think we're talking about tap dancing, and they say Dave's really gone off the edge here. I've got special know. shoes, man. No, <laughs> so, so I just realized I should have led into that a little bit better uh, for for people who haven't heard of your work. But what is tapping? Like, let's kind of define it, and then we'll go into like what you would do in a case of claustrophobia or PTSD or something, because like it's a fast thing. I've seen it work in ways that doesn't even make sense. Yeah. So tapping, we call it tapping uh, because we are literally physically tapping on endpoints of meridians of our body. Uh, another term for it, the type of tapping that I use is EFT, emotional freedom technique. And I generally describe it as a combination of ancient, ancient Chinese acupressure, right? That's the tapping component and modern psychology, because as we do this tapping, we're focused on the issue in front of us, the stress the anxiety, the overwhelm, the panic, you know, the limiting beliefs, whatever's going on. And, you know, for this has been around for over 30 years. And for a long time, the discussion around it was around the energy system in the body and, uh, you know, energy fields and meridians and stuff that I, I do think we're finding more research on. And I think in time, we're going to be able to say we can see it now, we can pinpoint it. But that research is still lagging. What we're finding in the last couple of years, really the last five years of research, is that when we tap on these endpoints of meridians, we send a calming signal to the amygdala in the brain. And Dave, you know, and a lot of your listeners and viewers know that the amygdala is that fight or flight center. It's the stress part of our brain. So we're focused on a difficult situation, claustrophobia, for example, right? When she has that reaction, it's her amygdala that's controlling the show. It's her amygdala that's firing. And what we do with the tapping is we bring up that reaction or it just happens naturally oftentimes. And we tap on these endpoints of meridians, send a calming signal to the amygdala and in essence counteract that signal. So someone can go and then have the same experience and the amygdala just doesn't fire. You know, why is it that some people fly in a plane and they're comfortable and relaxed and other people just thinking about flying? I've worked with many people with fear of flying and we could sit talking on Skype like this and I'd say, imagine getting on a plane and they start sweating. You know, but there's no logic to that, right? There's no danger, immediate danger, but the nervous system is so trained to have that fear. And it's my belief that literally everything in our life, every challenge in some way, shape or form comes down to that amygdala and to feelings of safety, being safe in the body. And I mean, financial things, if you're stuck financially, if you're stuck procrastinating and not doing the things that you want to do. If you have a book you've wanted to publish for 10 years and you just, oh, I procrastinate, I never get it done. What's it all about? It's not about, you know, that you're not setting the time or you don't have the right discipline. That all comes after we address the feelings of safety. Because if you don't feel safe publishing that book, if you think the second I put it out there, it's going to be on Amazon, it's going to get criticized. Dave, if you don't feel safe having a reporter in your kitchen, you're not going to take the steps to get there. You're going to usually unconsciously sabotage yourself. You're not going to return the phone call. You're going to delay. You're not going to write. You're going to do all these things to keep yourself safe. And with tapping, whether it be claustrophobia and those kinds of active fears or limiting beliefs and beliefs about who we are, we're always managing that safety and that fight or flight response. So, so you and I are 100 percent aligned on that, that fear is at the underlying or fear is the underlying thing behind pretty much every behavior you don't like. Unless yeah. it's like I'm too tired because my biology is broken. As yeah. soon as your biology is working, the next step is, OK, what am I afraid of that? I don't know I'm afraid of because it's so scary that my nervous system told me not to pay attention to it. Yeah. Like th that is the challenge of being human and certainly the challenge of kicking ass. But there's a ton of skepticism towards towards tapping, heck, towards acupuncture, and you're basically sure. using acupuncture meridians. <laughs> like, okay, uh, you're telling people here who are dealing with massive fears. Like, yeah. I've had PTSD. People on my team have had PTSD. It, it is heavy duty, gut wrenching stuff. Yeah. And you're saying that you can basically like tap between your eyes, and it just turns off. Like, you well, can see. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, one of the things I mentioned, it's been around for 30 years. And I often ask myself, you know, I've been doing this for over a decade and 
as you see, just one of my roles in the world is just to spread this, right? And I ask myself, why has it taken it so long to get accepted, right? Because the results are there. We're tapping now with veterans with PTSD. If a guy came back from Iraq and Afghanistan and nothing else is working, conventional treatment isn't working, meds aren't working, everything they're doing isn't working, and he does this silly tapping thing, six sessions or less, decreasing PTSD uh, symptoms dramatically. And this is research, both the research is there and the user testimonials. I think the fact that it is silly, that it looks funny, that it's certainly a stretch from what we've been doing is one of the things that's held it back because people go, oh, come on. And I also think the fact that it works so well in some way hurts it because a lot of the early proponents, and there are a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists out there doing it now. I mean, thousands of them. And you'll talk to them, I'll say, I was doing it the other way for 30 years. I brought this into my practice. It changed everything. I mean, I've heard that a thousand times. I think the fact that it works so well, that it's funny, that, you know, is, is what it's taking some time. But for the skeptics out there, it's really easy. You give it five or 10 minutes. You pick a personal experience. You pick something you're angry about, something you're stressed about, something you're anxious about. You follow the process. You learn it. You're going to know in 10 minutes that something different happened because you'll just know in your brain. And it still surprises me. And I'll be pissed off about something or I'll be stressed and I'll go, oh, yeah, there's that tapping thing that I should try, right? And I remember, <laughs> you know, and I sit there and I do it, uh, even though I'm angry that this didn't work out the way it did. And the feeling that comes over after me is, is so strange because what happens is, at least the way I can describe it, everyone's experience is so different. After you do it, there's just such a disconnect from the anger. You can try to reach for it. You can try to get mad again and just nothing happens, right? Because you're just disconnected from the emotion. You've turned off the nervous system and it says, I'm good to go, right? I just, this is an old issue. It doesn't bother me anymore. I'm moving forward. In fact, one of the things that we do in tapping is whenever we're working, we give it a number, whatever we're working on, on a zero to 10 scale. Because if we don't give it that number before, first, it's great to see the progress and to measure it. But oftentimes, if we don't give it that number, I'll work with someone. They'll say, oh, I'm so angry at my mom. I can't believe this. I forget to give the number. We do the tapping. And they've shifted their consciousness so much that they say, I wasn't really ever angry at her, you know? And I'm like, can we rewind the videotape? Because just five minutes ago, you were fuming. But when we move forward in our lives, right, you know this, when you overcome a challenge, sometimes you'll think back a year later and go, oh man, that used to be a real challenge in my life. And I don't even recognize that anymore. I've, I've fixed that. I've hacked that. This is just part of who I am now. And that's the human experience. We move past something, we just go to the next thing. So, so I've had people on the show talking about EMDR, which, yeah. which is a, a technique, and I've actually done it. I, I actually don't have a lot of trauma left with all the 40 years of Zen, all the neurofeedback things. Like yeah. There aren't a lot of triggers, uh, but uh, there was something that I was just having a hard time practicing forgiveness on because like, I don't want to hold other people's grudges, so like I'll, I'll forgive stuff. I don't have to tell the person I forgave them, but I'm just not holding on to it anymore. And that allows me to run my business without fear and, and to you know, be a good dad and all the other things that, that are on my list of things to do. Um, but when I was doing EMDR, which is you move your eyes back and forth in a certain way to sort of access a reset mode, um, my eyes got tired. <laughs> so the therapist uh, switched over to, to tapping. Yeah. And she was tapping on reading points. And that actually worked way more effectively for me than the eye movement thing. Is that a common thing? You know, EMDR is great. Uh, I consider it a cousin of tapping. Yeah. I think they're, they're in the same family. Um, I, my preference is towards tapping. One of the things that I love about it is EMDR has to be done with a therapist. Uh, tapping can be done with a therapist and that's great. And it's great to go to a trained practitioner, a coach, a therapist. You know, if, if, if you have a psychiatric disorder, disorder, don't do this on yourself, right? Go to a therapist who uses tapping, who can help you along, but also, and this is, I hear this from so many, you know, we've trained a lot of the people in my hometown. We can talk about that towards the end of the show, which is Newtown, Connecticut, the site of the Sandy Hook shooting. So we've been doing a lot of training around that trauma. And one of the things I hear from therapists on the ground all the time is that they feel that when clients walk away, they've given them a tool they can use in between sessions, right? It's one thing to be together for an hour a week and, okay, that's great. And, but what happens in the thick of it, right? The people giving them that tool that, so they feel empowered. And I think that's one of the baselines. You know, there's a lot of things going on with the tapping. 
certainly the physical component, but I think one of the baseline things that makes it so effective is that people take their power back. They're finally able to say, oh my gosh, I thought the anger controlled me. I thought the anxiety controlled me. I thought the pain controlled me. You know, for someone who's been in pain for 20 years, I've seen people eliminate it completely with tapping, but even if they just reduce it a little bit, to know they can spend five minutes and take the edge off after spending 20 years of being at the mercy of doctors, being at the mercy of surgeries, being at the mercy of medications, that taking that power back is a big step forward to healing no matter what you're doing. So these are, are bigger and bigger uh, uh, impacts that you're discussing here. Uh, and you, you've got some notable supporters, uh, Dr. Mercola, uh, it, it, it kind of came out with this. And I, years ago, when he first read about it, before you and I had met uh, and got to know each other, I was like, all right, uh, I'll, I'll try this. And I, I went to his post and, and, and I tried it. I don't remember what, what on, but yeah. I totally didn't get any effect. Yeah. All right. And how common is that? And it's possible I was doing it wrong. It's possible I was being overly analytical because I'm trying to monitor my own experiment. Sure. I have no idea, but it didn't work. But when I did it with a the therapist, it, it did have an, a very noticeable impact on reducing the reaction that I was feeling. So yeah. what? why the difference there? Well, it certainly uh, it matters what you're working on for your first experience. Oftentimes, people just try to be really broad. So they'll say, all right, let me see if I can work on fixing my whole life and the stress that I have and the fact that I feel terrible as opposed to saying, for me, that initial experience, get really specific, right? So that one thing that you can't forgive that person for that is driving you crazy, that you can't stop thinking about it, focus on that. You know, there's certainly ways that I can cue someone in doing the tapping to be specific, to have the experience to cue. So I think there's ways that you can refine the process down to have a better experience. And, you know, some people might not feel it right away. They might have to try more or try it with a coach, try it in different ways, you know. And, you know, anything that you give five minutes to, if even 50% of the people have an experience and a result in five minutes, that's pretty good. How did you discover this in the first place? Because it's kind of not intuitive. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I didn't. I didn't create EFT. Like I said, it was discovered. The tapping process was discovered 30 years ago by uh, Dr. Roger Callahan. He was a traditional psychologist working with regular clients and being pretty frustrated. You know, again, when I talk to psychologists and psychiatrists, they mostly say, I got into this profession to help people and I'm just frustrated that it's, I work with someone for five, 10 years and they're not getting anywhere, right? That it's the same kind of stuff. So Callahan was the same way. He was working with a client by the name of Mary. She had a water phobia, severe panic drinking water. I mean, it was just all out water phobia. <laughs> I mean, I, you can't it's imagine. Bad. You know? It's bad you for your skin. <laughs> yeah, no, shower, everything. It was just an out and out illogical phobia. And they did the traditional things, you know, talking about it, some exposure therapy. Okay, let's look at it. Let's try to do some deep breathing, that kind of thing. We're getting anywhere. Uh, one day they're sitting by... Dr. Callahan's pool at his home office and she's looking at the water and saying, you know, when I look at the water, I just feel queasy in my stomach. I feel like I have butterflies in my stomach. And Callahan had been hearing and reading about the acupuncture meridians and knew that the stomach meridian ends underneath the eye. So really just on a whim, he says, okay, try tapping underneath the eye. She starts tapping like this, 30, 40 seconds. All of a sudden she goes, it's gone. And he was like, what do you mean? It's gone. <laughs> you know, like the, the butterflies in your stomach are gone. Yeah, those are gone. But the phobia is gone. Just like that. And to the point where she's like, I want to get in the water. <laughs> and he's like, I don't know if you know how to swim. You know, like <laughs> this is like a lifelong water phobia. So you can imagine he was blown away by that result. He proceeded to work on the different points and set up the system. And one of his clients, um, Gary Craig, is the guy who developed EFT. And what he basically did was simplify it. He said, instead of doing different algorithms for different things, let's just do the same thing every time so we can remember it, so we can share it with people and for simplicity's sake. That's what I learned uh, personally over a decade ago. I started using it with friends and family. Uh, one of my first experiences was a little crick in my neck, which is just like woke up with pain in my neck. It's pretty bad. I heard the tapping works for pain relief. I said, why not? Let me try it. I tapped for five minutes, the pain was gone. And, and since then, the last decade, what I've seen with pain relief, we can get into that later because it is just mind-blowing. 
And a couple years after my initial experiences, I decided to make a documentary about tapping. And uh, that's the Tapping Solution film. I know that you're in the midst of a documentary right now, so you know, uh, <laughs> you know the ins and outs of it. To give you an idea, when I started the film, I had uh, no filmmaking experience at all. I mean, literally zero. Sounds familiar. <laughs> I, uh, I bought $40,000 worth of camera equipment on credit cards and credit lines. I was in real estate at the time. I was buying, fixing up, and selling properties. I knew nobody in the field. I mean, not a single person in the tapping field. But I knew that this technique worked, and I knew that if we could just start rolling and just start filming, we'd make it work. And somehow, you know, somehow we released it a year later. It's gone on to sell, I don't know, 150,000 copies at this point of the film. And I think in large part because it works. People see it. The film demonstrates really clearly. You know, we have, uh, we have some people in the film that we brought in to show the results. One of the things that I wanted was, you know, the secret had just come out. It was like hot secret time. And I thought it was great film and inspiring, but there was no real people in there. And I wanted to say, okay, if this technique really works, let's bring people in. So we did this event where we brought 10 people in from around the country, filmed them at their homes beforehand. They come to the event, we tap with them, and we film them during the event and afterwards. And so to me, it was kind of like, let's put this to the test in real life. You know, because that skepticism you talked about, it's there, right? When you see John, you know, a Vietnam veteran with 30 years of chronic back pain, multiple surgeries, he sees x-rays, you see everything the doctors told him was wrong with his back, the list of one thing after another. You see John do the tapping and wake up the second morning pain-free for the first time in 30 years. I mean, 30 years. That's when you start saying, there's something going on here that we have to explore a little further. I think we need to, we need to be adult enough in these conversations to set aside the, well, you know, it looks funny and I don't get where it's come from and say, there's a man who had pain for 30 years and now he doesn't. There's a woman who had fibromyalgia for 15 years and now she's symptom free. There's a bigger conversation to be had here about what we know to be true about ourselves and about pain and what we have yet to explore. Are you a fan of uh, John Sarnoff's work? Yeah. Mind uh, John body Sarno is, or Sarno, yeah, sorry. Sarno, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's amazing work. You know, my next book is The Tapping Solution for Pain Relief. And a lot of what I wrote in there, you know, builds on what he discussed. I mean, he's absolutely right about, you know, the mind body connection with pain. I, I'm really stoked on, on your new book uh, for, for that kind of perspective. Few people understand how much control you have over your own biology because your biology has layers in place to keep you from knowing you have control. Yeah. Like it tricks you into not having control. And there's something about uh, that that school of, of teaching that says you either distract the nervous system or you you somehow find an interface to it. And then all of a sudden you can do things that frankly shouldn't be possible except yeah. that they work. Yeah. And I, I'm really pleased that the guy uh, Callahan who discovered this, if he had been a little too skeptical uh, in maybe gone through, you know, a, enough of a, a strict Western medical school, he, he might have said, oh, th the phobia didn't disappear because it couldn't have. Yes. Despite the yes. fact that the phobia is gone, it couldn't have. So it didn't happen. Yeah. And I see this reverse science process all the time <laughs> yeah, yeah. with nutrition and with yeah. mind body and even just with functional medicine. Like it doesn't work because it can't, like, but the data says it works. So we can say, we don't know why it works and we don't yeah. like it that it works. And it's annoying that it works. Yeah. Uh, or maybe I don't believe that it works, but let's follow up. Either the experiment was wrong, but this outright dismissal of stuff like this is unscientific. It is, it is. And you know, what you always hear is the placebo effect, right? That's always a question. Was it a placebo effect? Well, the research studies are beating the placebo. So that's, step one and a lot of research is coming in and then the other component with the placebo effect and the conversation is starting to change around that and that's everything has a placebo effect in it everything everything you do because the placebo effect is the mind's positive expectation of a positive outcome if you start there that's a good place to start right whatever you're doing if you're taking a pill it's like people say you know well I'm trying to decide what to do with my cancer treatment and I'm so torn between going natural and chemotherapy and then I read all this stuff about chemo but then I went and got chemo but I was sitting there getting chemo and I was so nervous and anxious and I thought I was poisoning myself and it's like whatever you decide, go fully into it. 
So if you're getting chemo, you are just psyched, right? Full of positive expectation, positive endorphins, positive belief system that says, I made this decision, I'm sticking with it, I'm gonna relax, I'm gonna reduce the stress in my body, whatever you do. If you go alternative, good, buy into it fully. I think that's step one to everything you do. And we can't discount that and say, well, it, it's got an element of positive belief in here and that's what's affecting things. Well, great, like let's do it. Yeah, the jumping in with both feet is is kind of amazing, just having the right attitude. I, I had a chance uh, last year to meet uh, the CEO of a, of a very big company who had um, pancreatic cancer, the same kind that Steve Jobs had. Yeah. And it, <laughs> he doesn't have it anymore. And it, he found out, just like you said, he, he's like, I, I'm going to go for it. He jumped in and, you know, strict ketosis diet, uh, injected himself with insulin during chemo when the doctors weren't looking, like, like just just yeah. full on, just yeah. manages like a boss and yeah. and did enough to shrink his tumor to make it operable and, and did it. And wow. uh, his family never knew because he didn't want to freak out his kids. And wow. it's like, just, I, I so admire that, but that's that whole jumping in. If you come in with that fear and uncertainty, I honestly don't think he'd probably be around. And and seeing that kind of thing happen is, um, is, is remarkable. But are you are you proposing in, in your new book, the pain book, that people who have a hang up about something like surgery or about chemo or whatever it is that they're going to go through, that they can do something, you know, tapping in the right spots yep. in order to reduce their own internal resistance to jumping in with both feet? 100%. You know, so mm -hmm. if someone has a surgery scheduled, what I would say is you sit down and you make a list of all your fears about the, about the surgery. Oh, uh, you read here that, that this could go wrong. You don't know how it's going to heal. You're stressed about this. You're stressed about that. And then you do the tapping process on each of those individual things. You want to walk into that operating room. I'm not saying that you're going to walk in like there's not an ounce of nerves, right? But let's, you know, it's like comparing to speaking on stage. If you have stage fright, we can bring down the stage fright. So you walk out there maybe with a couple butterflies in your stomach, like, oh, this is exciting. But it's not that you're sweating and refuse to go on stage. That's what we want to do with surgery. That's what we want to do with, with you know, one of the things I see with pain relief is that people get so stuck on the diagnosis that they've been given. It's like a death sentence. They are told this. And if we look at the situation, right, you're going into, you're scared already. You've been in pain. Something happened. You were in an accident. There's pain that won't go away. You go to a doctor. They run all these tests. These aren't usually comfortable environments, right? They're just, they're just not. There are busy people. There are well-meaning people. The news usually isn't delivered in the nicest, you know, nicest fashion, you know, and usually because this is what the doctors have to do legally, they lay out everything that could go wrong. They lay out your time frame, your prognosis, et cetera. I would love doctors to say, here's your diagnosis. But just so you know, I've seen people heal from this. I've seen people, but it's always like, don't give false hope, right? Don't, so it's as negative as can be. Now think about that individual already in a stress state, already in pain, in a vulnerable place, listening to an authority figure with a white coat, right? It's like a parent. I mean, it might as well be a parent say, this is the truth about your life. This is a reality about your back. This is the reality about your pain, about your cancer, about whatever's going on. To me, the energy of that, the physiological processes that go on in the body. I mean, if we're looking at that amygdala and the fight or flight response, it is firing at all cylinders. And it doesn't just stop firing then. You drive home and you're stressed out about it. You tell your friends and family and you're stressed out about it. You wake up the next morning and you think, oh man, was that a bad dream? No, I was just given this diagnosis yesterday. You're stressed out about it. So your whole physiology is in that fight or flight mode. And you know this, Dave, body has two switches. It's either growth, right? It's either like growing, relaxing and healing or it's fighting, it's in the fight or flight response. We're either being chased by a tiger and we're running away and that's where our bodies, the processes, or we're relaxed, we're growing, we're healing. So I believe tapping, mindfulness, 40 years of Zen, all of these things are just moving us in the direction of activating that healing response. And whatever we do, whether we do chemo or we take drugs, whether we drink green juice, drink coffee, meditate, all these things, if we do them with a basis of this relaxed response, the 
the results are going to be just through the roof. They're going to be absolutely exponential. So, so let's say someone listening to, to Bulletproof Radio right now is a mid-level to senior level executive, yeah. uh, stressful job, you know, okay relationships, uh, you know, not, not exactly kicking ass, but not exactly failing by a long shot. Yep. How would they apply tapping to like to just performing better in, in general? Yeah. Well, again, going back to that stress response, it, it, it's my belief that for us to perform at our best, to have the creative insights, to be able to write for two hours, to be able to make great decisions, to be able to communicate effectively. You know, a, a CEO, if he is stressed out, he's just not communicating effectively. It's the bottom line. Now, sadly, most of our society believes that you have to be stressed. You have to show the signs of your stress because that way the rest of the company knows how hard you work. You have to, you know, burn the candle at both ends and just power our way through it. But you and I know that that is not the most effective CEO. The most effective CEO is the one that says, okay, let me look at these challenges that I have. And here's, here's what happens with tapping. This is why it's, it's such a beautiful process to do with meditation, to do, uh, you know, alongside it as a practice. Let's say a CEO is looking at something and saying, okay, I have this problem. I have this challenge that these numbers aren't working out, whatever, whatever it is, having problems with a staff member, doing the tapping on that specific problem, right? Going through the process, thinking about it, and then calming the amygdala, calming the body. What happens next? All of a sudden there's this insight. You know what? I didn't even think about this. Like I could have do it. I could have done it this way, or I can communicate this way to this employee. I can restructure what I'm doing here, I didn't even think about that marketing idea. You know, if we think about when we have our best ideas, what do people always say? Oh, it's in the shower in the morning. Oh, it's walking in nature. I was soaking in the bathtub. I had my eureka moment when I wasn't actively focused on this problem. What's happening, we're focusing on the problem, calming the amygdala, and then allowing that new creativity, that new insight to come forward. So walk me through the tapping points and yeah. if you're, you know, keep in mind half the people are watching this on iTunes video or on YouTube. I do so many radio interviews that, uh, I will take right. them delicately <laughs> through the process. The, the other half are not on video. So, so do audio and video, but I imagine you're good at this by now. All right. So let's do it. And let's actually have a little bit of an experience, right? So people right. out there will take five minutes to just so say, okay, let's see if something's happening here. So step one, we got to pick what we want to focus on, right? Uh, if you have pain in your body, it's a great place to start. Even aches and pains, right? You've got some stiffness in your shoulders. You go, man, I've been holding a lot of tension in my neck. Just pick a place in your body where it feels like it's a little tighter tense. If you don't have that, if you're calm and relaxed, pick one thing that you're a little stressed out about. Uh, it could be a petty annoyance. Something someone said to you a week ago, and you just keep, you keep running that email through your head and you just can't let it go. Something you're angry about, some future event that you're anxious about, just pick one and just pick one thing to focus on. Okay. So we have our target. Now give it a number on a zero to 10 scale in intensity. That way we know the shift and just pick a number. So you go, you know, I'm kind of angry. It's kind of like a six. I'm not that mad, but you know, I've been thinking about it for a while. All right. And then we're going to do the tapping. I'm going to use very general language. If I was working one-on-one -on -one with you or anyone else, we could go specific on them. But as long as your mind is focused on the issue, don't worry about the language being perfect. All right. So we're going to start by tapping on the side of the hand. It's called the karate chop point. And it's on the outside of the hand below the pinky. You take one hand to tap on the other. doesn't matter what you use. And you're using four fingers of one hand to tap on the outside of the hand. And you're just tapping continuously. And then repeat after me. Even though I'm holding on to the stress. Even though I'm holding on to the stress. I choose to relax now. I choose to relax now. We're going to still tapping on the side of the hand. We're going to say that two more times. Even though I'm holding on to this issue. Even though I'm holding on to this issue. I choose to let it go. I choose to let it go. And one more time. Even though I'm holding on to the stress in my body. Even though I'm holding on to the stress in my body. It's safe to relax and let it go. It's safe to relax and let it go. Now we're going to tap through the points. First point is the eyebrow point. Inside of the eyebrow, right where the hair ends and it meets the nose, you can take two fingers of one hand, the other hand, or both hands. The meridians run down both sides of the body, so just tap gently. You're tapping five to seven times, not counting, focusing on your issue, thinking about it, and just repeat after me this stress. This stress? 
And now moving on to the side of the eye. It's not at the temple, right next to the eye, on the bone. Again, one side or both sides. Thinking about your issue, this stress. This stress. And now under the eye, right on the bone. Again, one side or both sides. Focusing on the issue, this issue. And now under the nose, this stressful issue. This stressful issue. Under the mouth. It's above the chin, below the lip, and that little crease in there, right on the bone. You can curl your lip down if you want to hit it. Again, focusing on what your challenge is, this stressful issue. This stressful issue. Three points left. For the collarbone, just feel for the two little bones of the collarbone. And you go down just an inch, out to each side about an inch. You can tap with all ten fingers of both hands, this stressful issue. Under the collarbone or on the collarbone? It's right underneath the collarbone. Okay. Yeah, right in the meaty part there. This stressful issue. This stressful issue. Underneath the arm, three inches underneath the armpit. It'll be right on the bra line for women, a little further down. There we go. And again, one side or both sides, this stressful issue. And you can tap with all five fingers or all four fingers there. This stressful and, issue. And now last point at the top of the head, right at the crown, this stressful issue. This stressful issue. Okay. And now let's do one more round now that we know the points. Back to the eyebrow. And just take a moment to focus on the anger, the anxiety, the pain in your body, whatever it is you're feeling. And just tune into it. And now let's go to the side of the eye. If this was something that happened or something someone said or did to you, see them saying that. Still on the side of the eye. See that. Just see yourself thinking about it. Now, under the eye, if this was an event, play the event in your mind's eye. Under the nose, if this is something that's happening in the future, just think about that. Under the mouth, if you have pain in your body, just tune into that pain. Tune into that tension. Now back to the collarbone point. Focusing on the issue, under the arm, focusing on the issue, and last point, top of the head. And now take a deep breath in, and let it go. So that was a round or two of tapping. You know, the first time you're trying to figure out the points, and what we do after every round or two is are two things. One tune into the original number, right? So you see, okay, it was an eight, great. If it was an eight and it's a seven now, something's shifting. Uh, and then we also pay attention to what else came up because what will often happen through the process, you know, we did two and a half minutes there. As you work on it longer, what you'll find this happens is that you'll start tapping on one thing, the, your back pain, and all of a sudden you start thinking about your boss and something that happened three months ago. Maybe that's a clue that is somehow connected. It's our unconscious mind giving us these little clues and that's really one of the beautiful things about this process that, you know, as as opposed to sort of traditional therapy, if you're sitting down with someone on a couch, they're usually leading you a bit and reframing things for you. Well, have you thought about this? What if you forgave your mother? What if you did that? This is a more of a self-directed process, whether you're doing it with a practitioner or by yourself, where as you go through the process, you find, huh, I hadn't thought about that in a long time. I wonder how it may be related to what I'm working on today. Very cool. It, it sort of made me tired. I, I noticed that. Well, so there's another thing, right? I, I joke that when I, when I speak on stage, I am the only public speaker that doesn't get upset when half the audience is yawning because yawns are a big part of the tapping process. And it's relaxing your body. That's why people yawn. That's why people burp. I see it as a good thing. I see it as... Well, your body's finally, I'm sure you've been going all day and oh, yeah. busy times and a lot happening. And it's your body's, you know, saying, hey, let's let's slow down a bit. And that's a healthy thing, right? You can also use it to energize yourself. You can set that intention. You can clear blocks to being tired. But I don't think getting a little tired is a good sign that, you know, maybe it's time to, to breathe a little. Who are some of the, the notable people who are using... Uh, using tapping, like are there yeah. are there celebrities and people like that who are you know I, I know it? I know some celebrities in the UK. Um, there's some well so okay so here's a list uh, sports teams. 
I've found through the underground channels that there are some teams that have been using it extensively, which is really exciting. A team that won the World Series a couple of years ago. Um, I know publicly that a lady who I know well who works for the St. Louis Rams, she does tapping with her players. Uh, golfers, I mean, you got to think golf is such a mental game. A lot of golfers mm-hmm. do it. As you know, Dave, the challenge is that nobody talks about it because if the golfer is doing it and it's working for him, why is he going to give his <laughs> guy he's playing against <laughs> a leg up? You know, um, what other teams? So there's the Rams. There's the team that won the World Series, who I can't say who it was, but they made it. And they actually started doing it midseason when they were way behind. So you can try to figure out who it was from that. Uh, a lot of doctors. You mentioned Dr. Mercola. He's been doing it for a long time. He's a huge pioneer. Mm. Uh, Dr. Mark Hyman, who's our mutual friend, yep. he wrote the, the foreword to my book. Um, I was just I just spoke this integrative conference that uh, in in New York City where Woody Merrill, who runs Mount Sinai's uh, integrative center, he was there. What all these doctors are finding and is that they need better tools to manage the stress, the anxiety, the overwhelm that their patients are facing. And one of the beautiful things about tapping is that it can come in to those little moments. I love meditation. I think it's a huge part of my life and I know it's growing in a big way, but it's tough to, you know, say to a patient, Hey, why don't you meditate on this pain? Right? It's, it's like tough thing to do passively tapping on the pain. You can feel results in literally, you know, a matter of minutes. So people say, I got a result. I can keep doing it. It's something that can be shared really easily with others. And I think that's one of the reasons that it's spreading so widely. Well, congratulations on taking a, a tool that, that can be immensely valuable and just getting it out there. There's so many things that can help a lot of people that yeah. they're just unaware of, so they don't they don't ever hear. What's uh, tell me a little bit more about specifically the tapping solution for pain relief, your new book yeah. that's just coming out. Um, obviously, mention the URL and stuff like that, so people who are eager to hear about this can pick up a copy. But also walk me through like why is this a different book than the last book yeah. you wrote. Great. So it's, you know, the tapping solution.com is our main site where everything lives. Uh, you'll see everything about the book there. And uh, the difference is, you know, in, in my first book, there was a chapter on pain relief. I covered the topic. The difference here is that I've gone deep into breaking down specifically what are the things that it takes to heal. You know, I mentioned the diagnosis, right? The energy of the diagnosis, the experience, what gets locked up in the nervous system, if someone has a negative diagnosis, once you clear that, oftentimes the pain goes away. Um, If there's an accident, right, the trauma of the accident is huge. If every time, if you had a car accident five years ago and I say, hey, Dave, think about that car accident right now, and you start sweating and you clench up and you're like, I don't want to talk about it, that means it's affecting you on a daily basis and it's likely contributing to your pain. Right. Um, So in the book, I break down specifically what happened, when did it happen, how are the ways to tap on it. Uh, The book itself comes with eight tapping meditations, and these are tapping processes that I take people through a 10 to 15 minute process they can use on a daily basis, a guided process to go through the tapping. And, you know, the other thing I found, Dave, is that when someone's been in pain for a long time, it becomes part of their identity, just becomes part of who they are. It's wired into their nervous system. I mean, their brain knows how to do pain and their life knows how to do pain. And oftentimes when that pain starts going away, there's some scary decisions that have to be made, right? So if someone is on disability because of pain, you know, I'm not saying, oh, well, they're in pain because they don't want to work. They want to be on disability, but it's a factor. And when it's time to say, oh, the pain is going away. Now I have to go back to work. And guess what? I hated my last job. And this is a scary thing. Those things need to be addressed. Uh, Some of the people that I've found who are in the deepest pain, likely in part because they've had pain for so long, they've just lost a vision for their life, right? They've lost a vision for themselves for what's possible. So I spent a lot of time in the book trying to bring that back to life. You know, the goal is obviously pain relief. But at the end of the day, the people who have already read the book and gone through it, the people who have gone through the different pain programs that I put out, they find, yeah, the pain is going away, but my life is turning around, you know, and that's what I'm excited about. I'm I'm certainly excited that the pain can go down. I'm more excited when someone says, I found hope again. I found freedom again. I found passion. 
And really with anything, whether it be pain or any other physical challenge, disease, et cetera, that vision forward is a big component of it. And that's just one of the things that, you know, I get into with the book. It, it's a, it's a good read. It's definitely in terms of alternative treatments. It's definitely one of the more alternative ones, but I think there's a legitimacy to it and I've seen it work remarkable wonders on, on people uh, for sure. So it, it's, it's worthy of consideration. And also if you're a biohacker and you're tracking yourself and you think this can't possibly work, yeah. think about it. It's cheap and easy to try. <laughs> if it does work and it shouldn't, then you had false assumptions and you can actually go out and figure out why it actually does work. Or you can say, oh, it just doesn't work for me, period. And then you can test that out. But to sort of say it doesn't work, I think there's enough evidence in your movie, uh, in your first book, and through just practitioners that I know who use it, that, that there's something going on here. We probably don't know everything about it. Yeah. Well, and I think, I mean, to me, the ultimate test and, and some of the work that I'm most proud of is what we've done with the Tapping Solution Foundation and, and various charitable efforts. You know, when we've been working in Rwanda for the last five years and when kids who have lost their parents and siblings in the genocide, when they can find hope again, when they can clear the trauma. Um, I mentioned earlier that my hometown is Newtown, Connecticut. It's the site of the Sandy Hook shootings. I mean, literally, the shootings took place seven minutes from my house. And, you know, since that day, two years ago, we've been working on the ground, training practitioners, working with first responders, working with parents who lost their children. And, and we've just been one of many people who have been in the community trying to help. But what we hear again and again, especially two years later, you know, people think, oh, well, aren't people OK now? Two and a half years later. No, this is PTSD and trauma. And when people eventually find their way to us, what they hear, what we hear them say is I tried everything else and nothing made me feel better. I did this. And I walked out feeling better. That's it. Feeling better, right? And to me, that's the ultimate. You know, that very, very well said. And speaking of the ultimate thing to say, we're coming up on the end of the show, Nick. Yes. Oh boy. Did you do some tapping about whether you had your three recommendations for kicking more ass? Right you know, I was too busy trying to describe <laughs> the points uh, accurately. So, um, so I'm just gonna have to go off the cuff. You know, here we go. So uh, number one. Um, and, and I know this seems so obvious, you hear it all the time, but to, for peak performance, you have to regulate stress. You, it just mm -hmm. plays such a massive role. Again, we use it as a badge of honor all too often. I mean, I catch myself doing, oh, you know, you will say things like, oh man, yeah, I'm so stressed. And then you say, well, I'm actually not, but I just said it because this is what <laughs> everybody else says, right? So whatever you do, tapping works for you, fantastic. Meditation, walks. To perform your best, you have to regulate stress. It's just the bottom line. Um, number two, and I think this is perfect for this podcast. This is why I listen to your podcast and to other podcasts. It has transformed my life listening to audios. Like this is the opportunity. I mean, it's it's kind of a joke. You know, we compare it to 20 years ago, the information we had available. Books, yeah, some Nightingale Conant tapes that we had to you know, <laughs> stick in the Walkman, some good stuff there. But there is cutting edge stuff everywhere. Fill your brain with it. Just fill your brain with it. Uh, you know, every waking hour, you know, don't, don't be crazy, but there's so many opportunities doing well. I love doing errands and chores. It's like, Oh, do the dishes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm delighted <laughs> to do the dishes. I get to listen to both with radio. Like this feels good to me, right? These are the opportunities and, and fill them up. Um, thank you. And number, and number three, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we take for granted when we're biohacking, when we're looking to improve our performance, when we're f focusing so much on our body is we lose track of our relationships. And what I mean by that is that in the same way that stress is such a huge component in your life, the quality of your relationships is massive. That means if there's someone you haven't talked to in 20 years because you got into a fight, it's affecting your nervous system right now. If you don't have good relationships with your parents, if whether they're with you or not, if you haven't forgiven them, it's affecting you right now. You know, Dave, you mentioned you used it, you know, you're using it on forgiveness to let go, not to condone the behavior or say anything they did was right, but because you care to not have those attachments, right? Have to look around our lives and say, where are the places where I have unfinished business, you know? And one of the things that tapping can do so beautifully is you can go back to a breakup from high school. You know, someone could have broken your heart. And when you think about it now, it is unfinished business. It hasn't healed for whatever reason. 
heal those places and just watch how the rest of your life transforms. Wow, some, some powerful advice, Nick. Tell me your URL one more time. I think a lot of people who are listening to this now will be checking out your book, but just uh, drop that so people can learn yep. a few more tidbits of wisdom from a guy with a pretty good answer for that top three question. You got it. Thank you. Uh, the, so just T-H-E, tapping, T-A-P-P-I-N-G, solution.com, the tapping solution.com. All right, Nick, it is always a pleasure to get a chance to hang out with you and even more of one to have you on Bulletproof Radio. So thanks a lot for doing your work to help people get more control of their nervous system. And thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Dave. It's a pleasure. If you appreciated today's show with Nick Ordner, uh, do me a favor. Go ahead and check out his work. It's good stuff. And while you're at it, check out Bulletproof Coffee. Better yet, go buy a copy of the Bulletproof Diet book for someone that you care about who's fat. Give it to them and they'll become a nicer person. And you'll help me sell my next book to my publisher. Please help. <laughs> Have an awesome day. Talk to you soon.